The 20th century witnessed a remarkable transformation in the world of transportation, as the age of ocean liners gave way to the ascent of the jet age. At the turn of the century, grandiose vessels like the SS Kaiser Wilhelm II symbolized the pinnacle of ocean travel, representing the power and prestige of nations. Yet, in 1903, the Wright Flyer soared into the skies over Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, marking the humble beginnings of aviation's pioneer era. Little did the world realize that this momentous flight would ultimately render ocean liners obsolete. Over the following decades, a confluence of factors, including disasters, economic downturns, and two world wars, conspired to weaken the ocean liner industry. The transition from centuries of oceanic voyages to transatlantic flights, accomplished just 16 years after the Wright brothers' achievement, ushered in a new era of global travel. The development of jet engines and the rapid growth of national airlines like Pan Am, American Airlines, and British Airways significantly accelerated the decline of ocean liners in the 1950s and 60s. Welcome back to Compelling History. Today we'll conclude our four-part journey through the history of ocean liners with part four, the downfall of ocean liners. From the decommissioning of iconic vessels like the RMS Olympic and the SS United States, to the mergers and financial challenges faced by companies like Cunard and the United States Line, the decline of the ocean liner industry is a complex narrative intertwined with the emergence of aviation. Make sure you're subscribed so you know once the next series starts going live next week, and don't forget to like and subscribe to help out the channel. Part 1, Rise of the Jet Age On April 14, 1903, the SS Kaiser Wilhelm II slipped from her moorings at the port of Bremen on its maiden voyage to New York. Sailing across the Atlantic during the height of ocean travel, the Kaiser Wilhelm II was meant to represent the power of the German Empire overseas. This was a momentous event for Norddeutscher Lloyd as the Kaiser Wilhelm II was only surpassed in size by the RMS Cedric and RMS Celtic, the largest ships in the world at the time. However, nine months later, a much more momentous event would take place across the Atlantic, which would eventually make the ocean liner obsolete in the latter half of the 20th century. On December 17, 1903, the Wright Flyer took flight for the first time near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, marking the beginning of the pioneer era of aviation. The Wright Flyer was a biplane built by the Wright brothers, who owned and operated a bicycle shop in Ohio, and had a wingspan of 12.3 meters and a 12-horsepower engine built on a wooden frame covered in fabric. The Wright brothers used a wooden rail and catapult system to first launch the plane, and once it took off, it stayed airborne for about 12 seconds and traveled 36.5 meters. They would go on to make four more flights that day, and aircraft technology would rapidly advance from there. While it did not seem like it at the time, the first flight of the Wright Flyer would also mark the beginning of the end for ocean liners. The decades between that moment and the early 1950s would significantly weaken them through a series of disasters, global financial depression, and two world wars, which greatly disrupted the industry. It had taken centuries between the first sailing boats and the larger vessels that could regularly traverse vast oceans. In contrast, it would only take 16 years before British aviators John Alcock and Arthur Brown made the first transatlantic flight between June 14th and 15th, 1919. Furthermore, it would be only 55 years before someone could make the transatlantic journey on a Pan Am Boeing 707 in just under nine hours, fuel stop included. This dramatic reduction in travel time between continents and the continuous accessibility of air travel to the masses led to the rapid decline of ocean liners throughout the 1950s and 1960s. The jet engine revolutionized travel ever since its conception in the 1930s and its first flight during the Second World War, creating a rush to develop the most efficient aircraft, allowing for faster travel between nations across the world than at any point in history. Much like how steam engines enabled greater travel routes between nations overseas, leading to intense competition as trade along these routes grew over time, nations began to establish their own national airlines or allow for competition among private companies to serve this purpose. Airlines such as British Airways, American Airlines, Air France, and Air Canada were all founded before 1940. These airlines later merged with others to become the companies we know today, but perhaps the most influential airline in initiating the decline of the ocean liner industry was Pan Am, as previously mentioned. The company ordered 137 Boeing 707s between 1958 and 1983, given their popularity as the preferred mode of travel for journeys that had previously taken days or even weeks. Panem also played a pivotal role in the commercial development of the first jumbo jet, the Boeing 747, an aircraft capable of carrying up to 480 passengers between continents worldwide. By the time Pan Am's Boeing 747 made its maiden flight, the decline of the ocean liner industry was already evident. 
Many liners were being decommissioned or converted into pleasure cruisers, while smaller companies went out of business. Part two, decommissions and mergers. Arriving in Southampton after its usual transatlantic crossing from New York, passengers disembarked from the RMS Olympic for the final time in April 1935, 24 years after its launch as the flagship of its class. The Olympic was the only remaining ship of the Olympic class, as the Titanic and Britannic were lost. The Great Depression had made it difficult to maintain profitability, leading to the Olympic being sold for scrap. After being laid up in Southampton for five months, the Olympic set off on its final voyage to Jaro on the east coast of the UK, where it would be scrapped over a period of two years, marking the end of its 1.8 million miles of sailing. Many famous ocean liners of the day met a fate similar to that of the Olympic, with the Mauritania being laid up alongside the Olympic in Southampton. However, unlike the Olympic, the Mauritania did not end its career as an open liner. In 1930, the Mauritania became a dedicated cruise ship as the effects of the Great Depression continued to suppress the transatlantic industry. It ran six-day cruises from New York to Halifax and was painted white to signify its use for cruise service. Unfortunately, this did not save the Mauritania, and it was destined for the scrapyard in 1934. While converting the Mauritania for cruise service didn't work, it was a common option companies considered as it could be more economically practical for smaller liners. Most liners, at least in their first-class areas, drew inspiration from the finest hotels in Europe, usually their home nation. This furthered their appeal as cruise ships, as less work would be needed for the conversion. These converted liners would go on to serve well into the 1960s, with some surviving for a few decades longer. Converting ships for other uses and refocusing parts of your business will only go so far, and many companies would soon realize that their only path to survival was to merge and request financial support from their government. As discussed in a previous video, Cunard and White Star Line were severely affected by the harsh economic conditions during the Great Depression. Both were struggling, with White Star Line in an even worse position following the Titanic disaster. The British government would only provide financial support if the two companies merged. The resulting entity, known as Cunard White Star Line, later shortened to Cunard, managed to survive to the present day by diversifying its business after recognizing the challenges posed by the onset of the jet age. However, other companies were unable to salvage their businesses from bankruptcy. The United States line was formally liquidated in 1992, having already declined decades earlier. The United States line was established by the U.S. government to operate seas German ocean liners following World War I. Apart from serving as troop ships when needed, these liners aimed to provide America with a stronger foothold in the ocean liner industry. This foothold would only be reinforced following World War II when they not only acquired additional liners but also had the opportunity to incorporate years of rapid wartime advancements into civilian vessels. The United States line operated several iconic ships, with the two most notable being the SS America, launched in 1939, and the SS United States, launched in 1951. The SS America continued to operate for the United States line until 1964, when the company decided to discontinue its passenger services due to the rise of the jet age. The SS America was subsequently sold to the Chandris line and met its fate as it was wrecked off the coast of the Canary Islands in 1994. The wreckage remained above the waterline, slowly breaking apart as waves crashed against it, with a small portion of it still visible today. On the other hand, the SS United States served the United States line between 1952 and 1969 before changing hands several times during the 1970s and 1990s. The ship spent most of its time laid up before its interior was stripped in 1994 and it was moved to its current home port in Philadelphia in 1996. As mentioned earlier, the United States line discontinued its passenger services in 1964 due to declining passenger numbers attributed to the jet age. The company had been operating cargo vessels since its inception, and by the 1980s, it had a fleet of 43 ships and had acquired two of its competitors. In anticipation of a global increase in oil prices, United States Lines took out significant loans to build a new type of fuel-efficient container ship. These ships became the largest cargo vessels ever constructed, but just as they were completed and delivered, international shipping rates dropped and oil prices reached historically low levels. These massive and slow ships resulted in United States Lines having excess capacity, a heavy debt burden, and an inability to compete with faster ships that were once again economically viable. Unable to manage the debt caused by their fleet expansion, the company declared bankruptcy on November 24, 1986, marking one of the largest bankruptcies in U.S. history at that time. The onset of the jet age marked the beginning of a new era in international travel, at the cost of the ocean liner industry and companies such as the United States Line. Another notable company that became defunct following the downturn in passenger travel during the 1950s and 1960s is Compagnia Generale Transatlantica, 
commonly known as the French Line. The French Line operated a number of notable ocean liners, including the SS Normandy, which was launched in 1932 and served until it caught fire in 1942. The SS Ile de France, launched in 1926 and scrapped in 1959. And the SS France, launched in 1960 and only served for five years before being sold to Norwegian Cruise Line. Starting in the mid-1950s, the French Line began devoting an increasingly important part of its business to commercial transport, a trend that would only accelerate in the 1960s when air travel dominated transatlantic journeys. By 1976, the French Line merged with another company to form the container ship company Compagnie Générale Maritime. This company operated until 1996 when it merged with another French company to become one of the world's largest container shipping companies today, CMACGM. Although many of the original ocean liner companies no longer exist, traces of them can still be seen today. Despite the overwhelming decrease in transatlantic passenger numbers for ocean liners between the 1950s and 1970s, some managed to survive and continue their operations to the present day. Part 3. Legacy On March 23, 2003, the RMS Queen Mary II was launched in Saint-Nazaire, France, joining a fleet of just one other ocean liner in service anywhere in the world. The Queen Mary II would become the largest ocean liner ever constructed, and in November of 2008, it became the last ocean liner in active service with the retirement of the other Cunard liner, RMS Queen Elizabeth II. Entering service on January 12, 2004, the Queen Mary II has stayed in service to the present day, making transatlantic crossings and visiting other destinations throughout the year. Decades after the decline of the ocean liner industry in the 1950s and 1960s, the final nail in its coffin will come when the Queen Mary II is decommissioned. Whenever that may be, there does not seem to be any interest in building another ocean liner. And unless that changes in the coming years, this is likely the last chance people will ever have to travel on a true ocean liner. The iconic cruise ships of the Caribbean or Australia now dominate the ocean travel industry, offering passengers a pleasurable cruise experience in some of the most beautiful locations on the planet. The downfall of the ocean liner industry is bittersweet but necessary, as changing tastes and technological advancements inevitably led to its decline. As with any technological advancement, some of the older technology gets left behind, scrapped, while its remnants become abandoned transformed into floating hotels, casinos, or used for target practice by the world's militaries. The Queen Mary II operates and brands itself as luxury cruises on an ocean liner. The ship itself looks like a blend of old Cunard ships and newer cruise ships, with the iconic color scheme and the addition of ocean view balconies. Ocean liners will go down in history as one of the most extravagant forms of mass transit in human history. These grand ships have endured well into today in various forms and are likely to prove their usefulness for over a century. That said, it's safe to say that ocean liners are icons of the past, regardless of whether another one is built. They no longer serve a purpose in our modern world where people can travel between New York and London in roughly six hours on international flights, or three hours when the Concorde was still operating, or meet virtually to save themselves the trip. Instead of keeping the ocean liner title alive, we should let it go out on a high note when QM2 is decommissioned. Cruise ships are the only comparable vessels in use today primarily filled with entertainment options for passengers and mostly serving nearby ports. These are iconic ships in their own right, but they are not the same as the ocean liners of the 19th and 20th centuries. Those liners will be remembered as grand representations of their nations, taking the wealthiest individuals on trips to Europe and people seeking a new life to America. Ocean liners played a vital role in transporting thousands of families to the new world, which, in our opinion, is one of their most important contributions to the history of civilization. Conclusion the 20th century witnessed a dramatic shift in transportation as ocean liners yielded to the onset of the jet age. Jet engines and the emergence of national airlines like Pan Am and British Airways rapidly eroded the ocean liner industry's dominance during the 1950s and 1960s. Today, the RMS Queen Mary II stands as a unique relic, the final embodiment of a bygone era. Yet beyond nostalgia, ocean liners left an enduring legacy. They played a pivotal role in human history, facilitating migration and fostering global connections. Although the necessity of ocean liners has faded, their historical significance remains profound. They serve as a reminder of audacious dreams and achievements, leaving an indelible mark on the narrative of human exploration and migration. Thank you so much for watching the final part of Compelling History's series on ocean liners. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Next week, we'll be starting our journey through the history of the Roaring Twenties. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out.